Um, keep it really short. We technically say two to three minutes on Plum Alley. Um, coming from someone who watches these videos every day, I think two is more than enough. I usually am turning it off at like a minute and 30 seconds. Um, so if there's something really important you need to uh, make sure that your audience knows, say it at the very beginning. Um, another thing that I touched on is that on Plum Alley, you actually don't have to have a video. All you just, all you need is images, and we will kind of create a carousel where we'll cycle them through, so you don't have to worry about making a video if that's something that just seems too too hard for you. Uh, in terms of your description, which is pretty much the body of your campaign, the text, uh, you want to have an elevator pitch where you say what you're raising money for in three sentences or less. Uh, you want to talk about your background, how it's relevant to your project. And you want to talk about when and where you will carry out your project. So that if I'm giving you $50 for a pre-order of a shirt, it's very clear to me when I should expect that item. And it's not. That helps give a potential contributor um, security in that you have a plan for what you're doing. Um, and it makes people more inclined to, to make a contribution. Uh, in terms of rewards, so this is the topic of this uh, discussion. Think personal, what you can offer is, think about what you can offer that's unique to your project and to you. So, a lot of times we have people that if they're doing, I'll just keep using the shirt example. If you're doing a, a line of t-shirts, and let's say the t-shirt falls around $25, but you want to still be offering rewards at a higher level, you can offer something that's not directly tied to what it is that you're raising money for. So, um, for instance, there's one woman who raised money on Plum Alley who, was raising for this t-shirt line, but it turns out she was actually a phenomenal chef and she had gone to culinary school for a very long time before that. So at the $500 level, she offered a home catered meal where she came and went to someone's house and prepared dinner for that man and his wife. Um, and that's a great way to get larger contributions if you're doing something that's actually at a lower dollar level. Um, more isn't always better. We say seven, probably three to six rewards is more than enough. So having something at a $10 <coughs> level, uh, that can be like a handwritten thank you note and then working out. Um, in terms of the way that you display them on your page, you want to have the most expensive ones listed first and the least expensive at the bottom. So if I only want to give you $5, I have to scroll down all the way. Um, the higher ones are at the top. Uh, so this is kind of once your campaign goes live, this is a screenshot from our website where we're telling you kind of what you need to be aware of. Uh, you want to be sending emails, you want to be making phone calls. If you can, you want to hold an event, um, which can be really helpful if you uh, can get a lot of laptops, for, for instance, or iPads, and actually put them out at the event and have people come and you know be making contributions while they're there, make it like an active, fun thing that you're doing. Um, something to point out with this is that all of this work should be done prior to launching, so it's really a matter of once your campaign has gone live, you're in execution mode and you already know, you know on Monday I'm emailing Jim, Sally, and Bill, I'm calling my aunt Carol, you have an entire plan laid out and you're just kind of collecting funds and you know exactly where they're coming from. Um, so that's just a general on crowdfunding um, and reward-based crowdfunding. I'm gonna talk a little bit about Plum Alley specifically and how kind of Plum Alley was born, why we think it's important. So there's 161 million females in the US, 8.1 million of those are female entrepreneurs, and only 5% of VC funding goes to women founded companies. So um, what that means is that if you look at the top VC firms uh, in the US, only 5%, and I actually think this year it was more like four, only 4% 4 of that money is going to female founded teams. So that's a huge barrier if you're a female founded company, you're not, you don't have equal access uh, to money, which is critical, especially in earlier stages. Um, so this is relevant both to men and women, but especially for women, crowdfunding can be a really important step in kind of jumpstarting your business and getting you set up to raise an additional round of funding down the line. Um, and can also demonstrate to future investors that they have the things that they would look for anyway, such as You've exhausted your personal resources, you've reached out to your friends and family, you know how to ask for money, um, you have market traction. There's Those are things that they are going to want to know anyway, so if you've done a crowdfunding campaign, they can kind of check those off uh, automatically, which makes the job easier. Um, in terms of kind of where money comes from, uh, as I mentioned, most of the money will come from your network, and this is something that Alex actually touched on. Uh, 
projects by women are more likely to be funded by women and men by men. So on Kickstarter, 78% of their audience is male, only 22 is female, meaning that if you're interested in launching a project and you're a woman, that's not really your audience. Uh, on Plum Alley, 73% of our audience, uh, I actually think it's a bit higher now, is, is our women. So um, you have it, people there that are automatically more interested in what you're doing. Um, also, if you think about kind of the friendliness of these platforms, a lot of the things on Kickstarter, as you can see, this is one of our favorite examples to quote, is not something a woman would be interested in. <laughs> Uh, so, kind of in addition to what I've already covered, uh, that most of our audience is female, um, we have we focus on sectors that matter to women. We also have a ton of support. Um, this is actually what I do at Plum Alley: is working with people um, before they're going live, while they are live, and even afterwards to make sure that if they have any questions, we are there along with them for the process. Um, a lot of what we do advise people on is actually built into our platform. So there's lots of clickable boxes, there's things that pop up all the time, making sure you know what you should be doing at different stages. Um, and then if you have additional questions, we have a team that works with you, um, and that comes at no additional cost. This is just a, uh, this is a screenshot of our site. We've tried to make it very visually appealing, really user-friendly, clean. Um, again, this is uh, our progress bar. So. As you can see, it's uh, partially shaded right now, so that means that you've already started your process, but you know, if you're coming in and you have no idea where to start, you click on the idea or dream stage, and it's gonna pop up. It's gonna tell you what you should be thinking about right then. Uh, and if you're ready to move on, it'll move you on. Um, this is a couple of our success stories. Catherine Moose, uh, she's one of my favorites. She uh, was a college athlete who wanted to raise money for vitamin water she was starting, specifically for women. Um, she raised 107% of her goal. She's actually gone on to raise additional rounds of funding, like I um, showed you the diagram, and uh, her product's actually now in Whole Foods. So she is, you know, she really jump-started what she was working on via crowdfunding. Um, the same can be said for all the others. Um, yeah, so that's, that's it, and I'll just open it up for questions now. Yes? Apart from the criteria, like, Need to be the same ownership structure as you have for a minority or female-owned business. Mm -hmm. What about products for which the audience are principally women? Right. So, in other words, um, so the first question is, what qualifies to be on your platform mm -hmm. in the first place? Yep. The second question is, what if I got something not majority owned by women? However, the product or the service, the audience who are going to connect to this, mm -hmm. are principally women. So, who's yeah. going to care about this? The guys on Kickstarter who say, well, that's nice, maybe my wife will like it. Mm -hmm. Or the women on your platform who say, that's for me. Exactly. So we technically have a policy where it has to be um, equally part 50% male, female. That being said, we have had people that have come to us, and it's you know mostly a male who's working on it. But um, like you said, it's something that clearly is more appealing to a woman. In those cases, we do have exceptions. Um, we might ask that you have at least like a figure of a woman somehow involved on your team, but we're definitely open and like understand that that's uh, something that happens. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, how much are your, like, are your services? So we are, uh, we're all or nothing, meaning that you have to, if you say you want 30K, you have to get to 30K to actually get that money. Um, Kickstarter operates that same way. Indiegogo operates where you can keep what you raise, but at a higher fee. <coughs> so for us, we take 5%, uh, and there's a 2.9 processing fee, credit card processing fee, and that's pretty much an industry standard. Kickstarter takes the same percentage. Mm -hmm. Nothing I guess you can look up, but since we're all here, how large is the audience, and what's the most that's been raised for any particular product? Our Average usually falls around 20 to 30K, um, and our audience is, I actually don't know if we kind of distribute those objects, but um, it's big enough that we're, we're supporting projects as a Kickstarter would. Um, and that's, that's in part because we had uh, an audience of women who was really engaged with our e-commerce platform, who we were very critical to make sure, we, uh, we make sure to keep our audience very, very engaged, and when that, crossover happened, we kind of got new interest via crowdfunding, but 
all those female founded companies uh, and their networks have stayed with us. Um, I spoke to a couple of people who tried to raise money on this platform, and it's still like if you're starting the product, like nobody knows about this product, you don't have a list of potential people who are going to buy this product. So mm -hmm. how to go about it in terms of raising money, I guess, what's other options? So if you have a product that you're just starting and yeah. you don't necessarily have Honestly, you can still do crowdfunding. It's going to take more work up front in terms of finding people that are interested because the last thing you want to do is um, <coughs> just start it, just put it online, and then start scrambling to figure out who, who your audience might be. But there's definitely ways to you know, launch a new project with crowdfunding. You just need to do more work beforehand in terms of getting an audience together. Do you help with this? We, we don't help uh, in terms of giving you an audience. Like you said, um, you know, we're not going to be supplying the audience to you, but we, we do have a lot of tips and help a lot in terms of helping figure out how to book out that process and identify maybe a couple of key people in your network that would know someone that is interested in what you're doing and kind of taking it that way. So we will strategize with you, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I guess to follow up that, what kind of services do you provide to the project? You say you work, you can work with them one on one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we help with a range of things. I mean, I've been in a position where someone is trying to get, their audience might be over 50 or 60 years old and they're having trouble, uh, they don't want to put their credit cards in. So I'll get on the phone and do that, you know, I'll speak to their grandmother and help them through it. Um, everything from that to helping them, you know, write content for their description, uh, find someone to help them with their video, tell them which images best convey what they're working on, help them brainstorm rewards. Um, you know, the woman that I gave the example of, you know, prying around, okay, what else do you do outside of this? Is there something else you can offer? And, you know, getting people to think about it that way. Um, we, do, we do a lot of that type of help. In addition to, you know, technical stuff, like actually setting up the page. Do you help with marketing to so like a woman Women audiences? So something new that we're actually working on now is, um, and I actually did touch on. So with all campaigns, if you can get demonstrated traction, we say usually 30% within the first three to four days, um, you're much, much more likely to be successful, 90% like more likely. So we've actually devised something where you can raise money for three to four days behind the scenes so that your profile's not actually visible on Plum Alley. And if you get the 30%, at that point, we, we really, because you've demonstrated that there is an audience here, we put you on our platform, then we talk about you in our newsletter, we talk about you at events, we talk about you on social media, uh, in a way that you would have to be one in a million to get that kind of service on Kickstarter. Um, so we're testing that out now, and it's, actually, it's been working very well, because then what that gives people the opportunity to do is if in three days they don't get to 30%, they realize that their goal was too high and they can kind of regroup and start again. Um, that detoured a bit from what you asked, but yeah. It's all you. So uh, basically I heard it's also you need to run uh, Facebook kind of promotion, um, like in the week you have to have a certain amount of posts and stuff like this, so then maybe Google kind of pick it up or something like that. Could that <coughs> that? Sure. So you're absolutely right, using social media to kind of talk about successes and milestones, um, updates is really important. Um, doing that, you know, throughout the 30 days that you're alive is <coughs> critical. That being said, there's a lot of a lot of times people think that that's kind of where the bulk of the effort lies, and if they're doing that, you know, every day or every five hours, that that's going to be bringing in contributions. And it's really a more a matter of um, talking about successes or updates or you have a new reward that you just put on, something like that. Um, so it's oftentimes not as critical as some of the other work in terms of actually getting the network. Does that answer your question? I 
It's important, but uh, at least the campaigns that I've worked with, um, I've had people that don't even have that, that big of a, a Facebook presence, but they have a really big email list and they're actively you know, sending personal emails to people. And you know, Facebook at that point, not that it's not helpful, but it's not, uh, it's, it won't be the sole thing that makes your campaign a success. Yeah. Um, are you thinking, is there a minimum crowdfunding goal to be on the line? Four thousand dollars. That being said, if you came to us and said I really want to raise for three thousand five hundred and fifty five, we think it would be flexible. Yeah. Um, are only within the United States? Mm -hmm, not at all. Yeah, you can the the one prerequisite is that you have a US bank account or your your business does. But we actually have a couple companies, um, Actually, most of the companies right now working with are actually not in the United States. I've not been. Mm -hmm. oh. um, do you also suggest like are we like when you when you um, have a crowdfunding campaign? Are you supposed to like say exactly where the money is going, or you don't need to say that? Yeah, you definitely want to um, make it very clear to a potential contributor how you're going to use the money, um, and that's important for a lot of reasons, one of which is that it, it just adds a lot of credibility to you on what you're doing. And you know, if you're asking me for money and you say like, oh, I need like 25,000-ish and this is kind of what I plan to do, I, I don't really want to give you money. If you say, your $25 will go exactly to this, uh, that's this percentage of what I'm working on and then in six months you'll get this, that I just feel more comfortable. <coughs> um, we see that a lot with other Is there a maximum? No. What about if we don't um, get to the minimum amount of money we need? Mm -hmm. So what happens to the money that you have collected? So the way that it works is when someone makes a contribution, their their credit card's not actually charged; it's authorized. So essentially. Um, those authorizations are just remain pending for a series of time, and then once you get to your goal, they tip over and they start to be uh, processed. So if you don't reach your goal, they all just go back, and oh, okay. there's no fees, and okay. there's no charges to any of your And to Plumanali, will we have to pay anyway, or? No. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering, uh, what is the Yeah, absolutely. We we definitely work on growing our audience uh, and are very strategic about making sure that. And this isn't my role, but there's someone that does business development on that end, making sure that you know the events that she's at. She's very strategic about you know is this our, is this our audience? Are these people that would be interested in the projects that we're working on and and growing our base in that way? And it's, it grows every day. So yeah, we, we definitely have that in mind. So it means that you also filter the the project. Pardon? Do you also filter the, the project? So we do have a featuring system, yeah. No, filter. Oh, filter. filter. So like curate? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So that's part of what I was describing with the 30%. That, that in and of itself is kind of a filtration system because um, to be profiled on the site, you have to get to 30%. Um, and that's helpful for us and it's helpful for you as well because the last thing you want to do is put a project up there and it's not working and you have no money and it's on the internet for the rest of your life for everyone to see. Um, so with us, you know, if, if there's an issue and you need to adjust something, um, you know, until it looks like this is going to be a success, you just start handling it privately and, and people, it's not profiled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you can suggest you just said, um, if you're just starting out and you don't have audience and you don't know if your product is going to work or not, what do you suggest in terms of marketing in order to kind of, uh, to show the people your product and build this kind of list and stuff like that? What kind of marketing strategy? Well, it sounds like you're at a very preliminary stage, uh, which is great. So at that point, you probably want to be not actually putting you know, a campaign up at all, but really just talking with your audience and gauging their interest. And we have people that, you know, just reaching out to their friends and family learn a lot about 
what makes sense in terms of how to move forward. Um, and just getting feedback. You know, you just want to be kind of absorbing feedback before launching a campaign. Yeah, I've been absorbing uh, feedback, but it's just um, I need money to kind of produce this product, and it will depend how much money I'll get. I can go this way or that way, mm -hmm. and at, at this point, I have nothing to offer, and uh, I can sell maybe other products. Can I ask what your product is? <coughs> well, I design um, wool felted boots. Mm -hmm. And almost nothing like this on the market. I have like very little competition. Like I've been showing around, and people kind of like it, but mm -hmm. I think it's very different when you actually have to put the money and buy them. Mm -hmm. Also, I took them to the stores, and it's a totally different reaction because it's a new product. They're great to sell it because you know they have to pay money for it. So I'm kind of like stuck mm -hmm. at this point, and I don't have money to produce them because I need to, I, I find a manufacturing company which can produce like very bare minimum, which is 300 pairs, mm -hmm. or like sale samples, which is not even, like, it's not in the boxes, it's one size, or stuff like this, like, like right. I don't know how to go about it. Well, it sounds like you have been <coughs> talking about it enough that you have people that would be interested in purchasing the item. So the good thing about crowdfunding is if you know uh, let's say it's twenty thousand dollars. You know that that's what the manufacturer company has told you. You need to make this item. If you go with a platform like Plum Alley or like Kickstarter, where it's all or nothing, you if you don't reach that goal, it's okay. You know what I mean? You're not in a position where you're still liable to fulfill those rewards. Um, and crowdfunding for you might even be really helpful in terms, you know, beyond getting the money, in terms of getting feedback and. You know, seeing again, which is there a color or style of boot that gets pre-ordered more? You know, and even if you don't meet your goal, that all that information is still available to you. Um, so I, I think that you might actually be in a position to do it. It's just a matter of talking to people before launching and letting them know I'm doing it. You're going to be able to pre-order my boot. Um, you know, be on the lookout for my campaign, and just compiling a list of you know the people that you know are interested. Mm -hmm. Um, are there, um, in the way that the site is laid out, are there categories that uh, certain, that the projects fall under, and what would the categories be? Yeah, there's a couple categories that, um, <coughs> excuse me, like tech, uh, women and girls, food and beverages. Uh, we don't find that that really makes that much. It's not like if you you know put your product in one category, it's it's going to be more appealing. We don't see that that's that's super important. Mm -hmm. um, also in mind, do you have a percentage of folks that are involved in healthcare services or delivery of uh, different types of healing services, such as psychotherapy, massage, wellness, acupuncture? We don't currently. I mean, we're open to it. I think that you could offer, um, you know, you could offer a massage at a slightly discounted rate, and you know, offer that as a reward. So there's definitely ways you could tinker with it and make it work. But I was saying with the product that you're, that you're trying to crowdsource is actually that kind of a wellness product, not like a material good, but a yeah. wellness product. Absolutely, that's fine. Yeah, we, def we have service-based things um, in addition to tangible items, but definitely both, so it's completely viable. Yes, you're done then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.